This week on Arizona Illustrated, a trip back in time through the plants on the University of Arizona campus. Trying to identify plants that could be used in urban landscapes that were resource conscious. Technology that helps the fight against foodborne illness. What I feed to my family, for me, you know, nobody should be getting sick from foodborne illness in my house. When the summer days come to an end, the bats come out. And flying out at night to gather the food that they need to feed their babies and start the process all again. Looking for lizards in Sabino Canyon. What's important is that when you see one, you know, you feel it, you get excited about it. And Tucson's one and only quad guy. And I took my quad to karate and LA Fitness, and then I realized that it was fun. Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. We are joining you from the University of Arizona campus where the trees and plants that grow here can tell you a lot about why Arizona looks the way it does. You see, for a hundred years, the campus has been a laboratory for testing which plants from arid countries around the world are suitable to grow here for food and landscaping. So take a walk around the campus arboretum and step back in time. A lot of the early researchers wanted to identify plants that could be used as agricultural commodities. And so they traveled around the world, brought plants back to the main campus, and used the campus grounds as an experiment station. And as a result of their research, many plants were identified like cotton and citrus that were useful as a commodity crop in Arizona. As a byproduct of their research, many of those plants remained on campus and have grown to this day. Later in the mid-century, the needs of the state shifted more towards dealing with issues relating to resource conservation, especially concerns about water, as well as urbanization. Trying to identify plants that could be used in urban landscapes that were resource conscious. And if they were successful, they were then introduced into the nursery trade. You probably recognize plants like bottle brush, like Calistamon. Maybe you know Vitex, the monk's pepper. Many of the landscape plants that you find in arid cities throughout the world were tested here. Kind of by chance, we developed this incredible botanical resource, and many of these plants are on campus. So there was a feeling that there should be advocacy for their preservation and proper care. And so at that point, 20 years ago, the Arboretum was formally established. We consider it a living laboratory, meaning it's a dynamic place for people to learn. So trying and testing new and interesting things that are not just adapted to our past climate, but which are going to be better adapted to our future climate. We've inventoried all of the plants on main campus, and all of those plants are mapped on an interactive tree map. But we also have select plants with botanical signage installed and not only do those plaques now have the name of the plant and the origin, but it also has a QR code embedded. Participants can scan it, and it will then connect them to a web page that describes what that plant is. So it gives a really rich experience for people who just happen to be walking through the campus grounds. The Campus Arboretum collection houses specimens from every continent on the planet. We have approximately 1,200 unique species of plants that are growing on campus. Some of the most famous plants in our uh, collection are now designated as University of Arizona heritage trees. 
and there's 22 of them. One of the most well-known of the heritage trees, though, is the baobab tree. And the baobab is the only flowering specimen of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. Another really famous heritage tree in the collection is a date palm. And typically, date palms that we see in, in landscapes have a single trunk. This one has been allowed to grow naturally. It was a tree that was gifted to the university in the 1950s by the Iraqi government. This is a really cool thing about trees, that they were here before us, and they are usually here long after us. And so it's a way of giving us this broad perspective about where we are in time. As you can see, a lot of the experimentation that took place here on campus helped to make Arizona the agricultural center it is today. Another example, these beautiful orange trees off 2nd Street that sit between the dorms. You know, many of the winter salad vegetables that'll be eaten around the country this winter will be grown here in Arizona. Professor Sadhana Ravi Shankar has dedicated her life to making sure those vegetables are safe. In fact, she just won Inventor of the Year from Tech Launch Arizona for a new natural antimicrobial wash for produce. An E. coli contamination linked to lettuce is now spread here to California. An E. coli outbreak linked to baby spinach. And that outbreak of a stomach bug known as cyclospora. In the 2000s, fresh produce emerged as a huge vehicle of outbreak, and nobody thought that you know people will be becoming sick from eating salads. So all this was new to the food industry. This warning does keep expanding. It's getting bigger and bigger. And what the CDC is saying tonight is that you know not eat any kind of romaine lettuce. It is really important to have appropriate decontamination measures for these salad vegetables. And that is why the work we do in our lab with all these natural plant-based decontamination measures is really important. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Dr. So how is it going? So what uh, are you guys doing now? So we just finished sample 33. I am Sadhna Ravi Shankar. I am a professor at the School of Animal and Comparative Biomedical Sciences at the University of Arizona. My expertise is in food safety, and in our lab, we are focusing everything based on a farm to fork approach. So some of the studies we are doing are looking at what are the cross-contamination potential of environmental matrices, such as soil and dust, as well as irrigation water, onto the edible portion of the crop, simulating the conditions that can occur in a field in a laboratory condition. We are looking at how these different bacteria attach on the surface of various fresh produce, such as, you know, cantaloupe uh, versus a honeydew melon versus leafy greens. We're just starting today, right? And did you clean all these coupons already? Yes, yeah. so I have all the cleaning coupons. We do some pre-harvest studies in the lab in which we have to apply our treatments when the plants are growing, for example. So we do grow leafy greens and we do the treatments at different stages. And on the post-harvest side, we are looking at how to decontaminate produce commodities such as leafy greens, melons, using plant-based antimicrobial washes. And then we are also using antimicrobial edible films as either a wrap or as an ingredient going into salad bags for their decontamination potential against foodborne pathogenic bacteria. So I was awarded the inventor of the year, and I was chosen by the Tech Launch Arizona. And I like being an entrepreneur, and it's, I would say it is not that easy because I have to wear several hats in a day. And I think because of my passion, I'm able to multitask, and I'm able to do whatever it needs to be done, uh, both as a professor, as an administrator, as a teacher, and uh, also as an entrepreneur. <laughs> So 
you know, being in the food safety field and understanding how pathogens survive uh, in the food products and, you know, what are the points of contamination. When I make my own salad, I have to make it. I will not eat salad made by anybody else. And I know my, my family knows that's because what I feed to my family, for me, you know, nobody should be getting sick from foodborne illness in my house. As a researcher and as a scientist, what I believe is I should be doing research that could be put to good use for the community. So it should have an impact in the society, and that is the reason I chose this career, because food is something that everybody loves, everybody eats, and we want to produce a safe food. Well, as you can see all around me, the students are back in full force. Fall semester well underway. Days getting shorter, temperatures getting cooler. Time to say goodbye to summer. And it's also time to bid farewell to about 200,000 Mexican free tail bats that spend the summer living under our bridges. In fact, we spent a recent evening at dusk under one of those bridges as the bats came out to feed. I mean, where, where can you go to be so surrounded by a creature as magnificent as a bat? I mean, who ever thought of a flying mammal to begin with? And they're so stealth, they are so swift and so capable of catching things just by echolocation that they're really, really a wonder to behold. come out probably a uh, half a dozen times or so during the summer months to watch the bats come out from under. I have my daughter and my granddaughter in town and we wanted to come out and see the bats because it's a great opportunity for them to see something that's very unique to this area. Well, these bats come up from Mexico, come up from the south. Uh, it's interesting that they're all females, that they travel up here uh, with sperm that has not been implanted yet into uh, their eggs. And once they arrive here, so that they don't have to worry about excess food being pregnant, they do impregnate themselves. And they set up nursery colonies under about four bridges here in Tucson and we get to enjoy the results of their giving birth and flying out at night to gather the food that they need to feed their babies and start the process all again. They'll fly back south um, in fall and then they'll start coming back, uh, the females again, in April following year. We're just in one of the most biodiverse locations uh, on the planet and certainly in the United States. For me, this is my Eden. I mean, I, I just can't believe, you know, the wealth of wildlife that's here. It just makes the whole experience of living here just all that more exciting for me. Tucson is a terrific place if you like nature. We're very rich in biodiversity. And we're not just talking about animals that fly. We'd like you to meet the turtles that inhabit the Pond on campus here. They're a big draw right along Park Avenue. And there are many native creatures that scurry underfoot and you'll see them if you're quick enough. That's exactly the goal of the Sabino Canyon naturalists who do this, as you'll see in this segment, during their lizard walks. Should be a good lizard day, we hope. And we've got lots of eyes, so if anybody spots a lizard, please stop everybody and don't run up to it because it'll, it'll be gone before we get a chance. Yeah, there's two of them, yeah. This was designated a lizard walk. So we're looking for lizards and you never know what you're gonna see when you come out here. 
Our plan is to go down from here to Lower Sabino Canyon where the dam is and, uh, and back. So it's about three miles uh, and uh, uh, probably a couple hours. The naturalist stuff is my life. Well, I'm a retired dentist and I also have a PhD in oral biology. So uh, when it came to doing naturalist things, uh, it kind of came natural to me. Oh, he stopped me there. Oh, there he is. I see him moving. Okay. Tiger whiptail here. Probably a female. They're, they look very similar, the males and the females, but the, the females are, are smaller. The males have big, heavy uh, heads and shoulders, so they're just bulkier. You can tell the adults from the juveniles because the juveniles have blue tails. And when they're very small, they have iridescent blue tails. Lizard walks happen the first Saturday in May, in June, in September and October. And sometimes we also do them first Saturday in July and, and the first Saturday in August. Because that's when the lizards are out. <laughs> that's a, a zebra tail. Uh, if you get the right angle, uh, behind the front leg is uh, there's vertical, two vertical stripes. That's a side blotched lizard, and it's a female. Uh, the blotch is there's sort of a black spot behind the front, behind the front leg. When you see a whip tail, the, the length of the tail is uh, greater than the length of the body, actually, part. Uh, these guys, the tail is shorter. Uh, they may look a little bit like a whip tail, but they, these are ones that will go on rocks, and we, he's on the rocks. We as humans are endothermic, so we can control our own body temperatures by our metabolism and so on. Lizards can't do that, or reptiles in general. Uh, so they are ectotherms because they rely on the, their environment to uh, warm them up or cool them down to control their temperature. And they do a pretty good job of it. Okay. Yeah, just below the collar, I've got sort of my finger on them, sort of down. So the second one down, the one below the collar, uh, is a zebra tail. And I think in the photograph, you can see these behind the front leg are two black vertical bars. You could decide you want to learn the Latin names of them, uh, or maybe not. I mean, it's not, what's important is that when you see one, you, you know, you feel it, you get excited about it. He's an odd looking ornate tree lizard. <laughs> Maybe we'll see some other ones that look a little bit more like trees. If you want to get into lizard watching, go to a place such as Sabino Canyon, where you know there are gonna be lots of lizards and start looking for them there and also look for them in your own backyard. For more information on the Sabino Canyon Naturalist and for a list of their upcoming events, check out this story on our webpage for more information. It's always a thrill to spot something rare or unusual in the wild, and in this next story you'll meet someone who sparks the same kind of joy in Tucsonans who are navigating the urban environment. You may have seen them downtown, in the foothills, roaring through Gates Pass, or even as far away as Bisbee. He is known as the Quad Guy. And one thing's for sure, there's more to him than meets the eye. I am George Edward Roddick, Jr. I go by Eddie, never like being called George. And what do other people call you in town? The quad guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Guess who I just saw? With his hands in the air, his bandana waving. It was Quad Man. I just saw him when I was grabbing a Presta coffee at the Mercado this morning. T 
Tucson quad guy comes around the corner, and all of a sudden, my bad day became a good one. When I'm driving down the road and my eye catches a glimpse of quad man, I know it's gonna be a good day. I just love this grown man living his life the way he wants. I classify myself as a Europeanized Persian American. My parents traveled a lot. My dad was a pilot, full bird colonel in the United States Army Air Corps, and then he was a commercial airline pilot, and he met my mother in Iran. She was a stewardess, he was a captain, and I'd love to tell everybody it was coffee, tea, or me, <laughs> conceived in the cockpit. <laughs> When he retired, we were supposed to go to Colorado. He was going to buy a fishing resort. Can you imagine? That would have been awesome. You know, but he came here and he bought a liquor store. <laughs> and then they got divorced. And I was shipped off to boarding school in England and then 11th grade in Iran. And then my mother shipped me off here to a private boarding school, Fencer in Sabino Canyon. And you talk about culture shock. You, you go to an English boarding school for two years with uniforms, barbers, very strict, and then you go to Fenster Boarding School. It was co-ed. The girls were just across the lawn on the other side in a dorm. And, you know, I, I, you know, um, I, I enjoyed Fenster Boarding School. <laughs> I was married twice. First time was three years. Debbie left and my mother came over. She goes, I told you she would leave you. You know, and I said, I know. Impetuous as I was, I had this photograph of a family friend in Iran. Next thing you know, I'm on the phone. I said, do you want to come to America and get married? She goes, uh, I don't know you. I said, well, come to America. We got married two months later. <laughs> and then, so anyway, she divorced me kind of devastating for me and uh, my routine changed and I've taken up karate I got my black belt and I took my quad to karate in LA Fitness and then I realized that it was fun and uh, I got there a lot faster it was much more maneuverable in traffic and that's how I got on the quad and, and my lifestyle changed somewhat the more I drove around Tucson the more interesting it became you can drive around downtown and pass by several bus stops and people are shouting and smiling at you and you experience that and you smile inside and you turn the corner and somebody goes, loser! <laughs> Mixed emotions around town, yeah. During the day, Bruce Wayne and Batman kind of persona I get up and go to work and uh, I run a company about with 30, 40 employees. We're landscape contractors. Everybody who talks to him likes him. People that don't talk to him, they just look and wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's driving a little wild sometimes. No. It's great to talk to him about world experiences. He has a very, um, a lot looser look on life than most people, and I find it very refreshing. He encourages you to just enjoy life. Apparently, it was a couple of girls, and they started an Instagram page for the Tucson Quad guy, and I was a bit flattered. And then every once in a while, I get tagged. You know, there's a picture of me on 4th Avenue or somewhere in town. It's like Sasquatch sightings. <laughs> There was a young kid from Turkey. He was going to school here, and he saw me. And first time I saw him, he was wearing, you know, uh, Dockers and, and a polo shirt. And all of a sudden, I showed up here one day, and he jumped out of his seat, and he was dressed exactly like me. And it was the strangest thing in the world. And then he'd say, let's go get pizza. And i go, not together. <laughs> Depends on what kind of mood I'm in. If I head down the drive and down the mountains and head into town, if my ass is shaking back and forth, I'm listening to Shakira. If I'm leaning forward and my head is bopping up and down, I'm listening to ACDC. If it's a stormy night and I'm headed back at night, I'm either listening to Pink Floyd or um, Enya. <laughs> People go, why do you go in the desert when it's 110? I go, 
because there's nobody else out there and it's a surreal experience. The earth is like scorch crack mud and there's no live vegetation and all of a sudden you see that dark cloud coming in and you hear the sound of thunder and it comes and it moves in fast and it's a deluge and you sit down on the side of your quad and you put your feet into two inches of water the entire desert is now a shimmering lake of mercury with these apparitions of ghost-like dead mesquite trees coming out of the ground and you're sitting there with a can of sardines and a and a, and a military poncho in the rain and you feel like it's up the movie apocalypto <laughs> You pray, you think about the day, and you think about how you handle things, and that's part of the growth process in life, I guess. You sit on the side of a mountain and look over the valley, and you know the spirit of the ancient one, she's sitting right next to you while you watch. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Quad Guy is what I love about Tucson, Arizona, encapsulated in a man, the incarnation of the word freedom. Before we go, here's a sneak peek at a few stories we're working on. It's incredibly special because not only is it like you walk in and you feel like you're going back in time, which a lot of our parishioners dress in 1800 garb, but I mean, you just think of what has transpired in there, you know, down through the ages, the people who have worshiped there. And I believe it is because Jesus sees not only this man's physical condition, but the condition of his soul. I do muchas salsas. Sigo haciendo salsas de todo tipo. Me encanta hacer salsas y no hay fin para las salsas. Pues todo tipo de frutas, todo tipo de puedes hacer muchas salsas. Entonces se fue yendo las cosas por la cocina y al principio en Nogales, pues es Nogales, Arizona. Aquí no hay marisco, pues. En realidad no tenemos mar cerca, no tenemos nada. ¿no? Entonces la población de Nogales, Arizona, no estaba acostumbrada al marisco. Entonces yo empecé con carne primero, pero siempre ten... he tirado los mariscos. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, and we'll see you next week for another all-new episode.